I have a T thirty four. I have a M forty twenty six. Holy Jesus! What is that? What? The year is 1950, the Korean War has just erupted, and from the front lines are coming reports of the dreaded North Korean tank forces steamrolling through the defenses of South Korea. What has been referred to as the Korean tank panic is in full swing. With this backdrop, Life magazine in an issue covering the war included a dedicated segment to the tanks involved or soon will be involved. Here we take a visit to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds where a T-34 scratched the dash off its name tag went, how do you do fellow Americans? And had a fun day out on the track with the American boys who were undoubtedly impressed and curious on how their old friend they haven't seen in a few years lost so much weight. But hey, I guess you can't really argue that those five-year dieting plans are not proven to show results. That is what you would call a dark joke or an overused one, depending on your perspective. Despite being performed in the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, I wouldn't exactly call this a test, as I doubt the military would have gotten any new information that wasn't already known, but rather a spectacle where they raced around the tanks a couple of times for the cameras. Now, in hindsight, you could argue that the whole Korean tank panic was a bit of an overreaction, not just by the military who in turn pushed the M47 into production, but also by the reporting to the general public as seen in this article, where the general theme is that the T-34 was the best tank of the Second World World War and the US needs to catch up. However, reality would prove to be a little different, as would be shown later in the year. Essentially, the North Koreans were equipped with World War II tanks that could easily be outmatched by more technologically advanced World War II tanks, which the Americans already had. Also, we can't not talk about the boogeyman of Western post-war tank design, the IS-3. Despite its intimidating international reveal, it was still suffering from severe teething issues and would require an extensive modernization program before it was anywhere near as combat capable as it looked. Yet from the perspective of the West, many of these deficiencies were unknown, and the feeling that these could show up at any moment was real, with even rumors of vehicles misidentified as IS-3s, somewhat reminiscent of the Tiger Fear and the misidentification that occurred during World War II. But taking into account the fog of war and stories circulating of the 75mm guns on the M24s and older bazookas clinking off the armor of the strong Soviet tank all whilst Korea crumbles, it's not hard to understand the impression that kind of situation may give. Going back to the the Korean tank panic, this time looking at it specifically from the perspective of US tank development, and adding more hindsight to the aforementioned hindsight, by 1950 while the Soviet armored force still retained a large number of T-34s, the Soviets were just beginning serial production of the T-54. The IS-3M program was underway that would remedy many of the underlying issues of the tank, albeit at a somewhat high cost, and in a couple of years the T-10 would also come online. Therefore it is not like the kick in the butt for the US tank development was all for nothing. Thus the answer to whether the Korean tank panic was just justified would essentially be, well no, but actually yes. As implied earlier, this article is also quite interesting as it also provides an insight to the degree of the information on tanks that was available to the more general public of the time, including some of its quirks and knowledge gaps. For example, it contains a segment on tank tactics, where as kind of expected contains some broad dubious overgeneralizations that often conflates the tactical and operational application of tanks. For example, what is shown here as the Russian Blungeon would be an example of tactical application of tanks within a combined arms force during a tactical breakthrough of an enemy defensive position in Soviet deep battle theory, which would ideally be followed by something along the lines of what the article calls the Patton style, where mechanized units exploit the breakthrough into the enemy's operational depth, which also fits into the framework of Soviet deep operation theory, not necessarily something exclusive to Patton. There is certainly more I can nitpick on, such as the whole Sherman inferiority mantra, but I want to get to the fun part which I hinted at at the start of the video. This is what the article deems to be the perfect medium tank that incorporates what they believe are the best features of Soviet and American designs. The article states that the direction of tanks are heading towards is less of an emphasis on armor but more towards firepower and mobility on a lower profile. It proclaims the T-34 as the best tank of World War II on the basis of its speed and firepower rather than its protection. This is further compounded by how the track demonstrations were described earlier in the article, emphasizing how the T-34 outperformed the Sherman and Pershing in races over flat and rough terrain, but highlights how the M46 was able to beat the T-34 in these courses. It believes that the new M46 was the answer to the T-34s, not because of its heavier armor and firepower, which remained nearly unchanged from the M26 Pershing, and already at a substantial advantage over even the later T-3485, nor was it anything to do with the more sophisticated and refined instruments for the benefit of the crew such as its optics, but rather on its improved mobility. But going back to what this article puts forth as the ideal medium tank, the funny part is that the tank somehow managed to incorporate some of the worst traits 
traits of the vehicles in question and arguably ends up being inferior to all of them. You got the sloping sides of the T-34, which are now cast for some reason. Sloping sides takes up additional internal volume and takes space away from the crew and was often deemed not worth the increase in side protection. And this was a feature that would be removed in future generations of Soviet medium tanks, which also incorporated various other space engineering techniques to help reduce its profile. It also seems to have the VVSS suspension from the earlier Shermans. The turret has a bunch of weird proportion foolery going on, but overall looks way too small for the amount of equipment it is suggesting. What can be best described as trying to shove a 90mm into an M24's turret. It also removes the commander's vision cupola and moves the hatch to the rear center, but if we look at it closely, the commander sits on one side of the gun breech. And to top it all off, there's this very optimistic placement of a radar rangefinder. Overall, this is a vehicle that will be inferior to the M46 in terms of what the article believes to be prioritized, with the possible exception of maybe road speed, and its only clear advantage over the M46 is what the article deems to be least in priority, and that is armor, assuming that the 5 inches stated is the actual thickness, not the effective line of sight thickness after the sloping. Plus, it would also likely be an ergonomic nightmare. The article states it used the hull of the T-34 for its lower profile. However, the hull of the M46 was already around the same height as the T-34, and the total height was only slightly higher than that of the T-3485. So taking the T-34's hull is kind of a weird handicap with not much benefit in return. This tank isn't impossible because it's too utopian and asking for more than reasonable as the article suggests. It's impossible because even by the time the article was being written, people have already figured out better solutions. But hey, the idea of combining Soviet and American design elements to try to create the ultimate composite tank of the 1950s does sound like a fun sprocket project.